Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ventures Podcast. This episode with Jesse Bryan is important, I think, for a variety of reasons. But first, there is a fundamental problem that I, a lot of us that are working in the DAO space, decentralized autonomous organizations. And the problem is this. How do you coordinate a group of humans that is in a, in a way that is different than traditional corporate structure, right? Traditional corporate structure has command and control. How do we move to what people are saying is sense and respond? How do you move to a flat structure? How do you keep a bunch of people in a decentralized organization in moving in the same direction, doing the same things? So in this episode, Jesse just does, does a brilliant job explaining to us how a commodity plus a story equals a product, right? How shoes plus a story equals Nike, how coffee plus a story equals Starbucks, et cetera, et cetera, and how this way of storytelling can help co coordinate people who are working on DAOs right now. So if you're listening to this episode, you can also watch by visiting wclittle.com. There you'll see some more extensive show notes to the things that we talk about today. And if you're watching, you can also listen anywhere that you get your podcasts. You can just search for Ventures and it should show up. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with Jesse Ryan. All right, Jesse, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. So for those who don't know you, would you mind just telling us a little, uh, a little bit about your story thus far? Sure. Uh, my background really uh, far back, I started in film, worked with bands, all that kind of stuff. Over time, really got into the brand side, um, started an agency called Belief Agency, um, founding partner, CEO. Pretty much our sweet spot is telling true stories at work, where our goal is to uncover your true story and bring it to the market in a way that's contextualized and actually helps you achieve your goals by telling the truth. Mm. Um, and so everything we're doing is really about trying to prove true stories work. That's, that's our sweet spot. Proving that true stories. That's work. right. Yeah, it's that you amazing. don't have to, you don't have yeah. to BS people and you don't have to manipulate them. You can just uncover the truth behind who you are and what you do and articulate that in a way that's actually solves people's problems. Um, instead of doing the whole mass manipulation piece. So that sounds super simple. Why is that before we dive into NFTs and such, which I'm excited to talk about. Why is that so hard? Why is it so hard for people to just tell the truth and then prove it with their marketing? Um, well, you know, the, the main barrier is usually that organizations have forgotten that what they're doing is meaningful. Mm. So what they end up doing is they go and try to find something meaningful. You know, that's why you have so many brands that are trying to be Apple or Nike instead of realizing that. Apple's great at being Apple and Nike's great at being Nike, but you're not going to be good at being either of those, mm. you know? And so it's actually a, it starts by when people look at their organizations and they don't see the magic anymore. You know, that's actually where it starts. And then after that, you end up going, okay, well, in order to be myself in the market and to really talk about, you know, what we believe in and why we're here and, you know, what gets us going, um, that scares people because that requires vulnerability as a as an owner or C-suite. So what we do instead is we bet on data. And so we go out because it feels less scary. And we go out and we try to get as much data as we can um, so we can figure out how to manipulate the audience and to find what <laughs> we want them to buy. The problem is, you end up in one of two loops, either A, eventually they find out that you're manipulating them and how does that feel for your audience? Or B, you're in a position where every six months you're constantly shifting your messaging. It's kind of like if you had a friend who, who's always like, who do you want me to be? Who do you want me to be? And you're just like, just calm down, just calm down. Just take it easy, you know? Like you look desperate when you do that, you know? Um, there's no depth, um, there's no meaning. They can't maintain margins. Um, yeah, you just don't, there's no conviction. And when you don't have your own conviction, you have to borrow somebody else's. And so that's why you see um, everything is just, you know, 2% different than everything else. You don't have, you don't have those perspectives that really mm. make people uh, attach themselves to your story. You know, what I love in the underlying between the lines of what you just said is there's actually an optimism there 
that the companies have a magic. They have mm -hmm. a truth. They have a spark yep. underneath that has maybe has been lost for a variety of reasons. I love that because I'm an optimist, right? I invest in entrepreneurs. That's what I do for a living. So I'm always, I'm always yeah. eager for them to communicate that story to me. So it grips my heart and I'm passionate behind what they're doing. Yeah. And, and it, you know, you're 10 plus years into a, a agency that works with all kinds of different corporations to do this work. If you were to just summarize the, the, the learning, I know this is a huge conversation, but if you were just kind of summarize mm -hmm. the learning from, from that decade <laughs> plus, what, what would it, what would it be? It would be that when people can recognize their own value, or I guess until you can recognize your own value, you won't be able to demonstrate it to others. Mm. So I sit in my car if I'm going into, and when you say the funny thing about our client base is yes, it could be a football team. It could be a giant healthcare company. It could be an e-commerce company. It could be, we have, we work with all sorts of different folks and I'll sit in my car before I meet them and I'll go remind myself what they're doing is meaningful. I just have to find it. Mm. It's, it's leading with human dignity. My yeah. assumption is when I go in, I go, these people have come together in this organization that might be a hundred years old. There's something, there's magic here, mm. but it's just like for the same reason that, you know, I mean, I have, I have a bunch of kids, you have kids, right? You're mm. like, I love my kids. And then you go away for a couple of days and you're like, man, I really miss my kids. Sometimes you need distance ah. to remember, to see that what you have is magic, mm. you know? And so when, when I come in, I'm really just trying to, I just hold up a mirror. And so I ask, we ask all these questions, we have a whole process and stuff, but I'll ask them, you know, what are the questions the old, or what are the stories the old timers always used to share? And they'll tell me something and it's usually mind blowing. Mm. You know, I'll ask people, what was your best day at work? And because usually we're, the question people ask when you ask them, what is your product? They tell you something like healthcare or whatever. They never ask what their emotional product is, mm. you know? So if you're in healthcare and you started going, you know what my real product is, um, is giving people peace you know, in a scary time. Well, you would approach everything different, which means what's, what does that mean for success? It means when a patient comes into our oncology ward, they leave with more peace than they walked in with. You go, oh my gosh. Well, wouldn't that change the way you would think about the way you set up, I don't know, the chairs and whatever. And the way that the nurses and doctors would interact with the person they're talking to. Remember our real product here is, these are folks that are terrified. And our real product and what success actually looks like is that when they leave here, you know, they've got more hope or peace or joy, right? In the midst of all the pain. You would think about things differently than going, uh, our product, I mean, you know, we radiate people and try to kill cancer. You're like, oh, oh. see, you know, it's, yeah. and so when you can get to that magic, you start thinking like a person again. Mm. And when you start thinking like a person again, you can actually empathize with, with your customers again. And then you can rethink the whole thing. And it also brings meaning to your work because now you're more than just a cog. You're a person that is helping another person, you know, overcome something, right? So I, I, love, this, I love this from a corporate perspective. I love this from a organization perspective. I love this from an individual perspective. As you're saying all this, I can't help but think because I'm so deep in the DAO space, right? For those listening in, the decentralized autonomous organization, the promise here, the excitement that's getting hundreds of people in rooms and Discord servers and when working on all sorts of things is that there can be unlock, there can unlock a magic in corporate excitement, in, in corporate energy and passion to change the world for better or create some kind of product or service that will delight, that will solve problems. And there's all these experiments happening, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of experiments happening right now in Web3, where people are trying to figure this out. And I, and I just, I come back to what you said at the very part, first part of that question, which was discover discover your value, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this Japanese concept, Ikigai, right? Which is, which is the, 
the intersection between what you're good at experience wise, what you're passionate about, what the world needs and what you can get paid for. Hmm. Right? That's, that's this, this sweet spot. Yeah, that help. makes so much sense. And I can't help but think that in the future of work, when people are working on five or six DAOs or even just one DAO, they sprint, they're passionate about doing that work. They get compensated in whatever sort of giving economy or compensation mm -hmm. model that DAO has. Then they rest, they travel, right? They, right. They there's sprint. fairness, there's transparency. Yep. 100%. So how, what, and I want to get into um, some, some other topics in this conversation, but just sort of as a, as a sure. preamble for it. What can DAOs, as, as the, almost the space is starting now, Mm -hmm. What can they learn from what you just said? Like how, what, what, what can both the organization oh, yeah. and the mm -hmm. individuals that are participating in it? Well, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing, mm. right? Um, like anything, your real problems don't come until success starts. The only thing, you know, I think it was Jim Collins that says that most great organizations don't die because of something bad. They drowned on opportunity, you know? And if you don't know, if you don't have a strong compass of what matters, it's, it's really hard to know what to say yes to and what to say no to, mm. you know? Um, and even just the way that our brains are organized, they're really not optimized to do things for the long haul, uh, doing things in a healthy way for the long haul. Okay. Mm. So from a leadership perspective, there's this weird feedback loop that happens where the more successful you get, the more you're surrounded with people that tell you how great you are. And that status that you're getting from that, um, you literally get addicted to it. Right. And then all of a sudden, if people start giving you feedback, you don't want to hear it, it. It hits the same part of your brain that registers pain. When someone, it feels like someone's taking status away from you It in your brain, it feels like they're hurting, literally hurting you, mm. you know? And so all of a sudden you're excited about something. Somebody goes like, Hey, I'm really worried. I don't see why that's the best solution or whatever. And you're like, Tom, see, Tom, you're either on board or you're not. <laughs> that reaction is, it feels like you go, where'd this come from? You in their head by, they feel like your criticism, instead of saying nice, something nice about them, your criticism, because you want the doubt to be successful, whatever. Um, that can be taken as like a personal attack and what, and that feels personal because it actually hurts, right? When you get used to, when you get addicted to status and then eventually that's why you see these leaders over time, they start whittling down their teams and they start killing off all their generals, right? Mm. So all of a sudden anybody that had, you know, was at their level or had really could have ever threatened them as far as status or whatever, start taking, and then you get surrounded by yes men, right? Um, and then, then usually the tailspin starts happening where they move from that stage to they get um um they feel like everyone's out to get them right because they started realizing well now nobody's giving me feedback everybody's just giving me status so the and so anyways that's close yeah you're, they, yeah that's right that's right yeah, yeah yeah so that's naturally what happens to us okay that's why you see these things where it's like man that company was killing it what the heck when it just went off a cliff all of a sudden be, this is the pattern, right? Mm. Um, and so what I love about a DAO is you can avoid some of those downfalls that are almost baked into us as a species, right? You can go, well, you know, you can actually right size things and you can have things in place that almost protect us from ourselves. Hmm. So how does a DAO keep the main thing, the main thing? Let's get it. Let's give a specific you start example. with it here's where most people start is they'll start with they'll again they'll miss so at the beginning of a DAO, like banyan DAO, something like that mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um you met at the beginning you have all these incredible people coming together and they're not getting compensated yet and they're trying to solve a problem and they're really excited about this thing you know um and then at some point uh things get more and more crystallized and it gets more and more systematized and it turns well you start building all these structures around it and then all of a sudden you forget the thing that brought those people together at the beginning. And it just becomes about the output of their labor. Mm. Right. Um, and then that output of the labor ends up being at the center and you lost all the magic that even brought us together to begin with. Instead, what you want to do is really crystallize 
who are we? What do we care about? What are our beliefs and values? And because of that, how are we going to treat each other? How are we going to treat our customers? Right. And you solidify that. You write that down in like a, you call like a brand manifesto or a declaration or something so that in essence, what you want to do is paint yourself in a corner while you're still thinking clearly without status and money and all that stuff messing Mm -hmm. with your head yet, Mm -hmm. because it's impossible for it not to, you paint yourself in a corner that way you kind of go, even though I would love to, you know, <laughs> in my heart, I'd love to take more than I should, or I'd love to, you're like, I, I can't, you know, everything is transparent. That's <laughs> what I love about blockchain. It's like, it's all in there. If somebody starts doing weird stuff, with, it's all in there. So you want to paint yourself in a corner and then you want to put it um, on the wall. There's a really good case study in this, obviously not from the Dow ecosystem, but I think it's in, um, Jim Collins wrote the chapter on this in, I think it's called like the best business decisions of all time. And he talks about Johnson and Johnson with the Tylenol scare in the eighties um, for people that don't oh, remember yeah. when around it, they all of a sudden there was Tylenol getting poisoned and they didn't know what was going on. And what Jim Collins said was what made it one of the greatest business decisions of all time was not how they handled that crisis. It's what they did about a year and a half before that crisis happened where the new CEO sat down with all of its leaders and said, Hey, when Johnson and Johnson's, was about to go IPO at the beginning, right? When they were about to start offering shares, they wrote down this declaration and it said something like, we believe our first responsibility is to the doctors, nurses, uh, lawyers, mothers, and fathers that use our product. And it goes on. And so mm. it's saying pretty much, hey, don't buy our stock unless you also agree that we're going to do, first and foremost, make sure we're taking care of our doctors, nurses, you know, parents, pretty much people that are using the products that we're creating. Now, when the CEO came in, he went back to that document from like whatever the 30s or 40s and said, hey, do we still believe this? Because if we still believe this, we need to realign everything back to this. And they got into it. And pretty much he said, we either re-up to this or get out. Yeah. And so everybody re-upped. Now, year and a half later, the poisonings are happening. And the FBI comes to him and says, don't pull the product. It'll cause a commotion. Don't go on TV, right? It'll incite panic. And the CEO said, I'm sorry, FBI, but our first priority is to the doctors, nurses, mothers, and fathers that use our products. So immediately they pulled their product. They sat down. He went on like 60 minutes and they gave total transparency about what was happening. At the same time, they developed this new thing called safety caps. And that's Ah, where that came from. But in essence, everyone in a time of fear, he knew I, I have to be transparent. I have to do these things because that's what we all agreed to. Hmm. And now they actually have it carved in marble from what I understand in their headquarters, you walk in and this thing is literally carved in marble, this original manifesto. Wow. And so you, what you want to do is write that down before a crisis, write that down before. Remember a crisis can manifest itself in two ways. You can have something awful like a poisoning or a crisis could be People are about to give us more money than we could ever wrap our heads around. That's right. also a crisis. Yeah. And you go, well, is there a baseline? Is there zero so we can make decisions, you know, regardless of the situations around us? Does that make sense? Yeah. So if we do, if, if we take Banyan Dow as a practical case study, and the reason why I think this is important is because working with hundreds, if not now thousands of entrepreneurs over the last 20 years, this story always plays out in one form or another, which is this. Number one, Banyan Dow started with a vision for training Web3 product managers, right? People that can architect, design, and manage a project that's building a product, some kind of product or service to make things better because so much of the learned Web3 things out there were for software engineers, which is great. Like we need software engineers for sure building in Web3, but we also need product people to build great products because one of the main drawbacks of Web3 is a lot of these products are not, are super clunky. They're obviously built (laughs) by well-intentioned engineers that aren't necessarily pulling off the product thing well. And so it started with that kernel and people came Mm -hmm. together and like, great, I wanna level up, I wanna level up, but then it morphed into something which is and then that became our name banyan dow a tree that plants trees that plants trees and turns into this forest that is an ecosystem of organisms that are doing their thing but connected that are growing but are part of something larger than themselves 
So what, the reason why I bring up these two points is because I often hear this with entrepreneurship teams. They start with, hey, we want to do this thing and solve this problem. And then it actually creates this really interesting narrative and they, the, how, they, how they name their company, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're not careful, you're going to drown in opportunity, which is what you just said. So how, how do you guide Banyan Dow and the entrepreneurs listening in that can resonate with drowning in opportunity story here? So, so here's the thing. How you do something matters as much as what you do, mm. right? So if you say, hey, I'm going to drive from Seattle out to your house, Will. Okay. How I do that makes a difference, you know? Um, for instance, do I run people over on my way there? Mm. You know, uh, do I steal somebody's car? You know what I mean? It's like, it's the whole thing of going, okay, well, the way, great. We want to help people move from web two to web three. Why? Because honestly, when they're in a web three ecosystem, what we believe fundamentally is that that is a place that can actually achieve human flourishing. You know, mm -hmm. now the way we're going to do that um, is every decision we're going to make can't just be based off of, will this decision help grow my tree? It has to be based off of, will this decision help other trees grow that aren't even here yet? Mm. You know, it's the classic people used to, you plant a forest that you never plan on like being able to walk through. You know, mm. if you have, it's called banning down. So if you go, hey, okay, cool. This first group, we're going to build the, we're going to create the first tree, right? Awesome. And every decision, it has to be about what are the trees that we can plant with this group of folks in India and with this group of folks in Ohio and with this group of folks, you, it, by the nature of the tree analogy and how that actual tree grows, we should always be going, we should be making decisions for the trees we haven't even planted yet. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. How, so how we build an on-ramp for people to move from web two to web three, there's many brass tacks. You need a curriculum and all that kind of stuff. But the way you do that matters. Does that make sense? And the way you do that should be informed by who are we? What do we care about? Why are we all here? Does that make sense? So, so like, for instance, I could, I could start a clothing line and I could have better margins because I use child labor. Does that matter? Yes, hmm. it should matter. Well, how do I make decisions on is money the most important thing to us? If so, yep, child labor it away. Is there anything more important than money? And if so, you better be able to articulate that because if, in essence, if you have, it's, it's the whole, when we talk about um, commodity plus store equals product, you know, so, so you might have something like, I got this great curriculum. In essence, if you have something great, a technology or something else, but you can't explain it, it might as well not exist. Right. So if you say we have the Banyan Dow and you can't explain the story of why it matters and the name. And because by, by the way, that narrative is telling us. It's what it's actually doing is stories program right action. Hmm. Without a story, story is really just a simulation that says this is what right action looks like, right? Without a story, you're not actually teaching this team what right action looks like. And if people don't know what right action looks like, what do you think happens? People, it's the judges, right? Everybody's making, you know, martial law. Like I'm making my own decisions based on whatever. But if you add story to it, now you're saying, here's how in light of our name, in light of who we are and what we're doing, this is how we're going to treat each other. This is the way we're going to approach the market. This is how we're going to treat our vendors, right? We're going to think in terms of, you know, 20 years instead of 20 weeks, like all of those things. And you go, this is what we're doing. Are you down with that? Yes or no. And then if somebody's down with it, they sign the document and say, yeah, I agree. I'm going to, I agree that in this community, we're all going to treat each other this way, treat our vendors this way, think about our clients this way, whatever. We have a shared united logic. Now people can thrive, right? Now they can thrive because they can go, oh, I know the story, right? Like if I just say, hey, we're going on a trip, I go, okay, in order to understand what you're talking about, I need a narrative. And you go, oh, well, we're going to Portland for these reasons and we have to be there by five o'clock. You giving me that story gives me context so that I can prepare for a trip down to Portland from Seattle to Portland versus a trip mm. to Seattle to San Francisco or whatever. Mm. They're different. Without the story, there's no context. Without the context, I don't have a handle. Mm. And if I don't have a handle, it's just, it's, I don't know. What, so it's a DAO. Like I don't, so even when I explain DAOs to people, I don't start with, you know, decentralized. I go, I go, you know what a co-op is? You ever heard of a co-op? You ever been a part of one? You know, REI or something like, yeah. I go, cool. There's a new way to do that. It's called a DAO. It's use old stories to explain new concepts. 
Because when people think there's this magical new thing that they'll never be able to understand because of all this coded language, it does the opposite of what Web3 is supposed to be about, right? It becomes an elitist thing just for technologists, you know? And that is not what my understanding of what people are trying to do should be or is. Does that make sense? That's good. So the so the entrepreneurs listening in that are facing the, I, I loved I love your formula: commodity plus story equals product. Did I get that right? right? Yep. So if you're an entrepreneur and you so have, here, here's what I mean. Yeah. Here's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Shoes plus story equals Nike. Coffee plus story equals Starbucks. Fill in the blank. Football plus story equals Seahawks. You name it. The problem is most people go, I got this fantastic pair of shoes. And if you just knew how the leather was made and it's all this stuff, I was like, okay, you know, or I'll be talking to somebody, they have an amazing technology and they're like, but if you just understood the underlying code and that it's so elegant, it's like, you know, no one's going to see that, right? Like until you add a story, you have no ability to even have any margin. Mm. The most important thing is it has to be a true story. That's why it has to come out of your organization. Mm. If you just hire someone like me to make some shit up, that's always a bad idea because someday, Will, they're going to meet you and they're going to go, yeah. that doesn't feel at all like the messaging I read about the Banyan Dow. Mm. And it's like, yeah, you know why Will did that? Because Will doesn't think that the Banyan Dow actually matters because if he did, he would be able to tell us the true story about why he's willing to invest his time and talent and treasure into this thing and why it matters to him. If he doesn't have an opinion on it, I go, then why did Will start it? Mm. Oh, he just saw a business opportunity. Okay, uh, that's fine. I personally don't know how to message that because all you're left with is manipulation. Mm. Does that make sense? And there's a lot of people that are good at that. It's just, it's just <laughs> when you have something special, there's a guy named uh, John Haggerty. He was Sir John Haggerty. He was so good at advertising, he got knighted. He's the one that turned around Levi's and stuff in the 80s. And he says, you don't bear your differentiation. You shout it from the rooftops. The reality is this, you are the differentiation. Every, th uh, the, every time you hold a product or interact with a product, that is the manifestation of a group of people's beliefs and values. Mm. If you hold a real Louis Vuitton bag and a fake one, you can feel the difference. You know why? These people value craftsmanship and all this. These people value speed, affordability. You can feel it. If I, if I use your product, what is it a manifestation of other than the people that made it? How could it possibly be anything else? So I want to know who are the people that made it? Why do they care enough about this to sacrifice for it? Why does the world need this? And then you have to have the guts to go out and just tell people that. Yeah, because Harari, every, people point back in the Dow space, I'm hearing a lot of people point back to Harari who wrote Sapiens and Homo Deus and a bunch of other sure. books. And mm -hmm. he, his whole thesis in Sapiens was it was story that bound humans together and allowed humans to flourish originally. Because without mm -hmm. those stories, you couldn't coordinate. And so- Well, it's, so yeah. stories are just, um, I'm not sure if it was him or somebody else that said, the first human invention wasn't fire, it was story because it solved the problem. How do I get something out of my head into yours? And what you have to understand is story structure is just millions and millions of years, um, human beings have been creating an efficiency model to move data from one place to another. We call that a story. So what that means is if you understand story structure, it means you can more efficiently move data from one person to another. What does that mean from a market perspective? Mm. It means I can move more people than you can. Why does that matter? Well, when Steve Jobs says the most powerful person in the world is a storyteller, that's what he's talking about. And when he said things like your whole life changes when you realize that when you push on the world, it moves. You know what makes it move? Well, stories make it move. Mm. You know, it's like data by itself doesn't, Jesse, do you know that there was this many people did this interaction? I'm like, okay. But in light of what does that, and how does that matter? Well, it only matters with context and context is communicated through story. It's why what Warren Buffett said, what is the only thing he has on his wall that's framed certificate from the Dale Carnegie class he took on public communication? Because he said, nothing will give you a bigger return than understanding how to you know, communicate in front of a group of people. For me, I would say nothing will help your career more than understanding you know, how to tell a true story that actually works for your audience. Mm. That's the whole game. Because if you understand there's two pedals on the bike, you program people with stories, you maintain, uh, you maintain story at, through status, right? So you tell a story, you think about it, all this stuff you can learn by just watching your kids. Hey, I saw the way you treated your sister. And you go, hey, in our family, we don't do that. Do you know, like, and you tell them a story, right? 
And then mm. you maintain it with status. Hey, I noticed how well you were trading your sit today. I really appreciate that. Mm. Those are the two pedals that make people work. Okay. So the funny thing is, how often do you hear about those things in a business context? Right. You go, okay, so so it sounds to me like ultimately you think you can achieve this without communicating with a person. Because as yeah. long as you have to communicate with a person internally or externally, you better understand how these two pedals work. And you also have to understand that, by the way, you can use these pedals to build the Boys and Girls Club, or you can use these two pedals to build the Third Reich. It's literally the same tools. That's why you also have to be very careful. This is fascinating because often I hear the two pedals as product and marketing, product and marketing, but I actually <laughs> like how you shift it. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, because here, yeah. listen, most business conversations, it's just a bunch of insecure people. So they hide, they hide behind uh, fancy words, mm. you know? Like if you go into a conversation with somebody who's really good, you'll be able to understand everything they're saying. If you go in with a charlatan, they're going to use a, they're going to overcomplicate a simple thing, mm. you know, and you'll be like, oh, why? Because if, because the way they're trying to maintain their status is by using words you don't understand, because there's actually a tactic. If you read the 48 laws of power, one of the tactics is to confuse people into thinking that you're powerful, mm. right? So they use big words and then you go like, it's like you're in finance or whatever, buying a car. And they're like in the APR and you're like, whatever, whatever, man, hold on. I'll just sign. I just don't, I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. And I just want to get out of here. And then you yeah. sign and you do something stupid lawyers. That's like the number one tactic, you know? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means you go like, well, let me ask you this. Everything you need to know about human communication, you can learn over coffee, sit down with the person in front of and go like, okay, what are the stories they're telling and ask questions? why they tell me that story? How are they maintaining social order? How do we do that in a society? Oh, we do that with, through status. Primarily, the way we used to do it in groups of up to 30 was through a thing called gossip. And gossip is just a shortcut to this is what our social norms are. So next time you hear someone gossip and they say, hey, Will, did you hear that uh, you know, Tom left his wife? What is the social norm they're trying to reiterate to you? Oh, I guess in this society, we don't leave our wives. Oh, did you hear this person was talking shit? Okay, well, what was their, what are the social norm they're trying to maintain? Literally until we got outside of like ice age level, like once we moved for over 30 people, the way you maintain that tribe was through gossip. And yeah. then once we started agrarian and we had more people together, then we moved to a thing called status, hmm. right? Because status is, yeah. is literally, all, we self-organize like in the military through status. And, 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 you know, anyways, but, it, but if you just think about those two pedals of like, man, I have a great product here. I go, fantastic. Okay. How are you going to align your team internally without stories and status? How are you going to take it to market? If you don't understand stories and status, how are you, what do you, those are the pedals. And if you understand those pedals, the cool thing is you don't need an MBA. You can learn all of this stuff just by watching people. It's beautiful. So I see how, when you go and do your thing, in, in with an executive suite, a C-suite, and the whole organization mm -hmm. is command and control and, and issues down, hey, like your Johnson & Johnson story, hey, everybody, this is what we're going to do. We're going to come back mm -hmm. to these values. There's a CEO that's, that's, that's championing it. A lot of the yeah. Dow movement is a shift from command and control to sense and respond mm -hmm. to a more organic, decentralized. And there's a lot of cynical people that said, well, that's just never going to work. And okay, so I, I got I got an answer yeah. for that. Okay, Billy Wilder, one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, definitely one of the greatest screenwriters of all time, always said, "If you have a pro, if you have a problem in your third act, you actually have a problem in your first act." Mm. Which means, if you ever got in the movie and you walked out and you're like, "That ending," right? A good ending is all set up at the beginning of the film. Mm. You set up, oh, Harry Potter, he's an orphan, and all these things. So by the time this happens, you set up Luke. He's on a farm. All he wants to do is be a starfighter. So by the time he blows up the Death Star, it's satisfying, right? Mm. If you have a good first act, it solves your third act problems, right? If when you join a DAO, we have a collection of stories that we all say, this is why we're here. This is what we're doing. Again, you're modeling right action. Mm. Do not join this DAO unless you're also trying to do those things. Now we have a collective understanding just like in the ice age with 30 of us or how many people, right? We have a collective understanding of the stories that are going to maintain us and what we're doing so that when we have problems later, we can be like, Hey, George, here's our real problem, man. Remember how you signed that document at the beginning and said, we're all going to treat each other this way. Remember how, right? 
Mm. It's the, those collective stories on the front end, right? And the agreement upon that allows us now to have a baseline to have conversations moving forward. Does that make sense? When you don't have those stories, when you don't have a first act, imagine watching a movie without a first act. Where all of a sudden you're like, you know, Luke just jumped in a spaceship. You're like, okay, so I guess there's spaceships here. Who's that guy? Does anybody know who that is? Oh, he has a friend. Who's that guy? He seems kind of rude. And who's the big furry guy? And you're like, oh, that's, that's okay. Hold on real quick. So blah, blah. it's like, you'd be like, I don't know what's going on. Make sense. Mm. So in the same way, uh, Brian will tell story, this story where he goes, Hey, Will, the sun on my face, the wind in my hair, sand between my toes, man, it was the best. You'd be like, what? If instead a first act is I had the best time in Cancun, Will, the sun on my face, the wind in my hair, the sand between my toes, you take out that first act everything else is confusing mm. right most times when i see a ceo or somebody like that getting really ticked off about their team not being aligned i'll be like how could they be you don't even tell them a story about what they should be doing mm. you have it in your head and you haven't even given it to the other people right and remember vision creep is like whatever whatever and every 90 days it's like you need to tell that story every 90 days you need to remind people <laughs> right. at this DAO. this is how we treat people this is why this is important this is why moving from web 2 to web 3 honestly will allow you to have finally be acknowledged for your work and be given human dignity but it's also going to allow us to do that for other people so as we grow your tree we will always be thinking about the person that helped grow your tree and how you can help grow the next person's tree and you find a new and interesting way to explain that every 90 days wow and then what that does is you keep self-regulating a group through story because if you don't use story you know what you got to use a thing called force so i can either tell my kids stories and they go oh yeah i should look both ways before i cross the street or whatever or I can say, if you don't, pro if you don't look both ways before you cross the street, I'm going to beat you. And that's how most people do it in business. Pick a lane, story or violence. For me, it's like, learn how to tell stories. You already know how to do it. Mm. You just got to figure out how to crystallize it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in the same, so it's almost like DAOs now have an opportunity to look and reverse to history and extract the good out of the ways that humans have become what we are now from the okay, earliest I, tribes of let's humans. Do, history is perfect. Yes, that's right. How do we get our understanding of business right now? Where did it come from? As far as I can tell, it was Rockefeller was the one that really started going. This is what a corporation looks like. This is how we do like mm. blood and guts, right? Eat everything you can type of business. Go back a hundred years before that. Will, you have a store in town, right? And I come in. Now, you know me because we live in the same community, you know, and whatever. I, I have a cattle ranch, right? Now, you wouldn't sell me some garbage because, you know, I'll just be like, hey, Will, you sold me all that stuff. It turned out all the apples you sold me were bad. I wouldn't sell you bad meat because you would come out to my ranch and be like, hey, man, what the heck? We're all in this together. That was, if you go back, even like from a data perspective, it's go. Hey, Will, I know when your kids is having a birthday and her favorite book. And so I ordered an extra one copy of the new one. You don't have to buy it, but you know, it's just a recommendation because I was thinking about you guys, you know, and you go like, oh, it's literally the way we do things now. But back then you couldn't hide behind numbers and data. Mm. Scale creates distance, as Simon Sinek said. So all of a sudden, once we, inter once we figured out we could weaponize data against people and we can turn them into numbers, we can do, we can justify things. That's why the Nazis put numbers on your arms, because it's easy to kill eradicate a number mm. or to screw over a number than it is a guy named will who's a human being that's breathing in front of you right my hope for business is we just go back to the old ways of doing it and go like well how would you want literally will i'll do stuff like this with you as well i'll be um i'll be like they didn't even know we're talking about strategy oh i'll be like well hey can i ask you a question you've been doing this a long time um how do you build long-term relationships with a person oh i mean i don't know you gotta well, you got to be clear and honest and you got to do what you say you're going to do. And, you know, I think it's really important to, you know, be there for them, even when, you know, maybe they're not in good shape. And I go, fantastic. So we just established our strategy on how to build our customer base. You go, okay, well, how would it be any different? How do you build long-term relationships? Write it down. Now I go, fantastic. Apply that to your business. Oh, well, in that case, if one of the ways that you build long-term relationships is that you listen more than you talk. Okay, cool. So what's our mechanism, Will, on hearing from our customers? Oh, we don't really have one. 
But I thought you just said in order to build a long-term relationship, there has to be like a two-way conversation. And you're saying we don't have a call center or we outsource that. And then we don't really even care about the data we get. Does that make sense? So what you're saying, this is extremely powerful. And I think this will, this will get us to wrap up part one here is that the power of story doesn't need to be actually reinforced with command and control in a DAO. It can be reinforced from the community. And as long as you do act one right, that will be reinforced as people start whatever trees they're going to start in this forest. That is correct, sir. That's why um, Seth Godin, who I think is the only really like brilliant marketer we have now alive, he said it very simply. People like us do things like this. Okay, Will, how hmm. often in one form or another do you or your wife remind your family, people like us, hey, I want to tell you, you know, hmm. you guys know that you're right. We forego some of the things we could have here physically, like stuff. But you know why mom and I do that, right? Hmm. Do you know why rest matters to our family? Do you know that there are people out there? And they're being treated in this way. And we do all these things. But people like us do things like this. We mm. look out for people mm. because we know that if we were in their position, the same thing would have happened to us. And you're programming them through story towards right action. Does that make sense? And then all of a sudden, now you have a standard. And status can be, hey, dad, you know, I don't know. When your kids, are, hey, dad, you know, I made some money off this thing. Like, I really want to give 20 bucks to rest. And you were enforced with status and you go, that's awesome, man. I'm really proud of you. Mm. He feels good, blah, blah, blah. Now, again, it's story or violence. You know what I mean? Now, mm. a, the beautiful thing about all this stuff, Will, is once you realize you can learn everything you need to know about storytelling or marketing or positioning over copy with another person, it demystifies all this. And you start going, well, I don't know. What do you think? Just as a person, I, I remember back in the day when pop-ups were a thing, talking to a, a high up person in marketing and they were talking about pop-ups and I was like, do you like them? And they're like, oh my God, I hate them. I go, why are we doing them? <laughs> and then usually you get an answer like, why aren't we supposed to? I was like, but no, you, but you, just a second ago, you said, I hate these things. And these are our customers that we should be thinking about all the time and trying to make their lives better. And you're saying we should do something we hate because somebody told us we should do it, even though common sense would be treat them the way you would want to be treated. We just stop. It, it's like, there's this weird thing where as soon as you introduce words like marketing or business, people stop thinking. They yeah. move into these weird tactics instead of just going, yeah, but well, hold on a second. Are they people? Are they the actual people we're talking to? Yes. Oh, well, how else do you talk? How do you normally talk to people? Yeah, because the pop-up thing was a good example of something you said earlier where people have trouble moving a long time in one direction because the pop-up thing, right, because I was in, in, the, in the 2000s when we were experimenting with all these different ways of manipulating human behavior in web browsers, when you mm -hmm. got 100,000 people a day coming to a website and you did a little pop-up, it temporarily spiked the number of subscriptions and the number, you know, the KPIs we were tracking but we lost sight of the forest. We lost sight of the types of customers we were attracting. We lost sight of who and what we were trying to be. You are correct, sir. Short-term wins. You know, like when I hear about societies that think in terms of generations, I'm like, how can we not think like that? Mm. That's why we're in the state we're in because we stopped caring about our neighbor and we stopped caring about anything beyond ourselves, right? When people think that way, Things get better for everyone, you know? But this isn't complicated stuff. And even when you, the pop-up thing, I just, I read a book about like the history of the church in America. And it was fascinating because when I, when I, people follow incentives. So if you incentivize right action through your DAO, guess what you're going to get? If you incentivize kissing the leader's ass, guess what you're going to get? Mm. You're going to get a dictator, right? The beautiful thing about a DAO is you can actually, incentivize right action mm. hey will uh, will or not i mean you know your name you can be totally anonymous looks like you committed that code and it all checks out guess what they get paid yeah it doesn't matter if you like them or any of that like so if you build that incentive piece because the pop-up thing if you incentivize the wrong action it screws everything up so this is why my understanding and you've been in technology way longer than me my understanding was the original way that you would 
benchmark, what a website was worth was based off of clicks. By that one move, well, I guess, how else do we base it? There's a traffic, is it clicks? That one move has massive repercussions because of what the way you chose to incentivize something. What does that mean? It means I'm going to build all this crap into this ecosystem to get a click, even though it doesn't, it makes reading harder. It makes actual product, it, all of those things. And I was saying at the same time that that was happening with technology, the church goes, well, if that's what success looked like is clicks and views, I'm going to apply that to this other industry. And then things became about clicks and views, right? You're incentivizing this. And so from a doubt perspective, if you figure out your stories and then what would, in light of our story, our true story about who we are, um, what does that mean for how we incentivize people? Well, wouldn't it mean we need to incentivize them like this? Fantastic. We just solved that. And then you, and then all of a sudden you're incentivizing people to live the same story together. And what that looks like on the outside is a team who is hyper-focused, connected and ready to kind of take on anything. The, but the funny thing is if you travel all the way back up here, it's going like the real problem, people are down here with symptoms, you know? And then you ever like a chiropractor where they're like, oh, your arm hurts. You know what's actually wrong is your lower back. And you're like, right. how are those even connection, right? right? It's like, well, the way you pull and all this. And it's like, most people, they have these business problems and they go, well, your real problem is a story problem. And they go, let's, stories are for kids. And I'm like, okay, cool. I guess, I guess that's where you're at on that. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, I want our team to have this be right action. It's like, okay, number one, the, the best definition of propaganda I've ever heard is propaganda is a story that benefits the speaker, but not the listener. Is the story you're telling inside of your company only benefiting you? Well, no wonder nobody cares. Mm. If they, I'm going to tell you a story about how I can buy another yacht. And it's like, how's that not inspiring to all of you? Mm. It's like, because what? You're telling a story that only benefits you. And a lot of times corporations will do that. And you go like, oh, we went out with this whole campaign and we thought it would galvanize stuff. It's like, no, that whole campaign is about how your shareholders can make more money. You didn't find a way to bring everybody into it and show how we're all going to win together. You know, it's still just about you and you don't get why you're not at the center of the universe. You know, again, these are things DAOs can help, help with. This is really exciting. I love it. All right. I right, let's get part two on the books soon because there's a thousand other questions yeah. I want to ask you. If people want to just continue the conversation with you, where, where could the best find, find you online? I'm, I'm most active on Twitter. Just Jesse Bryan on, at, at, at Jesse Bryan. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, Jesse. Right on. Really appreciate it. Sure. Happy to. Thanks, Will. All right. A couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups and health science and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe and you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it would be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.